فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم فصل في تأديب المتعلم بالآداب السنية وينبغي أن يؤدب المتعلم على التجريد على التدريج بالآداب السنية وشي وشيم المرضية ورياضة نسي بدقائق الخفية ويعوده صيانة في جميع أموره الباطنة والجلية ويحرضه بأقواله وأفعاله المتكررات على الإخلاص والصدق وحسن النيات ومراقبة الله تعالى في جميع اللحظات ويعرفه أن بذلك تنت ويعرفه أن بذلك تفت تفتح عليه أبواب المعارف وينشرح صدره وينشرح صدره ويتفجره من قلبه ينابيع الحكم واللطائف ويبارك له في علمه وحاله ويوفق في أفعاله وأقواله فصل في حكم التعليم تعليم المتعلمين فرض كفاية فإن لم يكن من يصلح من يصلح له إلا واحدا تعين عليه وإن كان هناك جماعة يحصل التعليم ببعضهم فامتنعوا كلهم فامتنعوا كلهم أثموا وإن قام به بعضهم سقط الحرج عن الباقين وإن طلب من أحدهم فامتنع فأظهر الوجهين أنه لا يأثم لكنه يكره له ذلك لكنه يكره له ذلك إذا لم يكن له عذر فصل في حرص المعلم على تعليم طلابه يستحب للمعلم أن يكون حريصا على تعليمهم مؤثرا لذلك على مصالح نفسه مؤثرا لذلك على مصالح نفسه الدنيوية التي ليست بالضرورية وأن يفرغ قلبه في حال جلوسه لأقرابه لإقراب لإقرائه من الأسباب الشاغلة كلها وأن يفرغ قلبه في حال جلوسه لإقرائهم من الأسباب الشاغلة كلها وهي كثيرة معروفة وأن يكون حريصا على تفهيمهم وأن يعطي كل إنسان منهم ما يليق به فلا يكثر على من لا يحتمل الإكثار ولا يقصر لمن يحتمل الزيادة ويأخذهم بإعادة محفوظاتهم ويثني على من ظهرت نجابته ما لم يخش عليه فتنة بعجاب أو أو غيره ومن قصر عنفه تعنيفا لطيفا ما لم يخش تنفيره ولا يحسد ولا يحسد both ways you can say أحدا منهم لبراعة تظهر منه ولا يكتثر فيه ما أنعم الله تعالى به عليه فإن الحسد للأجانب حرام شديد التحريم فكيف للمتعلم الذي هو بمنزلة الولد ويعود من فضيلته إلى معلمه في الآخرة الثواب الجزيل وفي الدنيا الثناء الجميل The teacher should strive to discipline his student gradually by instilling him with good manners and praiseworthy qualities. The teacher should manner his student على التدريج. على التدريج here means gradually. The student will come to you, you don't throw everything at him at the same time. You teach him bit by bit. So you tell him from gradual stages what he's doing, what is wrong. So you say today you focus on teaching him this is wrong. And tomorrow you focus on something else that's wrong. And then the next day, something else that's wrong. Whereas you don't throw everything at him on the same day. The reason is because something that's taken all at once will be left all at once. The scholars, they say, Man jumla jumla. Anyone who takes knowledge all at once, it will leave him all at once. And manners is knowledge that a person will attain. So if you give it all to him all at once, he will lose it all, all at once. So the teacher does it all gradually. So he teaches him today, 
a couple of characteristics which he needs to work on and then tomorrow he teaches him other characteristics which he needs to work on and bi murur zamani as time goes on wa tatawul zaman and as time lengthens the student will learn that these characteristics that he used to have are not very good and he himself before anybody else will recognize that this is something awful that had come from him now and train him to practice that which is admirable no matter how trivial while accustoming him to closely monitoring all his affairs at both inward and outward levels the teacher here he teaches the student shia mil mardiyya the praiseworthy characteristics and he makes the student train himself on those things even if they are very very detailed issues even if it's something that he feels that are trivial issues they don't really really this yes the reason is because in al jibala min al hasa that the mountain is from pebbles the mountain is what is from pebbles it is pebbles that have come together that has made this great mountain which you see today and this house that you, this masjid that we were in today it's made out of bricks that have come together so everything that you think are little you belittle and you see that they are trivial issues when they do come together when they do come together they are what bring about destruction so the person never belittles a wrong he does never belittle a wrong and so he knows that this is something he needs to work on regardless of of the weight that he feels that he holds he also the teacher observes his students private and public affairs he observes it because the job of the teacher is that his student comes out well trained that a student doesn't have his private affairs and the public affairs of the student is all intact now the teacher must teach his student to be sincere in all he says and does to be truthful have good intentions and continually be watchful of allah at all times the teacher yuharriduhu he urges the student and always pushes him to observe his speech his actions that come from him he also reminds the student to observe sincerity to be truthful and to perfect his intentions he always talks to the student about observing allah in his actions and his speeches and his do's and don'ts everything of his life he tells him muraqabatullah allah is looking over you my student and allah tabarak wa ta'ala he knows your harakat and your sakanat allah knows your movements when you do things and allah even knows when you're not doing anything let it all be for his sake subhanahu wa ta'ala and don't do it for anybody else so the teacher here he install, instills that into the heart of the student now he should let the student know that if he holds such qualities and that if he practices such manners the doors of understanding will lay open for him and that he will become more disposed and inclined inclined to learning and that the springs of wisdom and meticulous understanding will gush forth from his heart and that Allah will bless him and his knowledge and grant him success in all he says and does then the author rahimahullah he says and he, the teacher brings to the attention of his student that with these good manners and these good etiquettes and this way of, of holding yourself is going to bring and open for you all the doors of knowledge you're going to learn through them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to widen your heart and your chest and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He will gush out of your chest. And Allah will bring out of your heart, meticulous wisdom. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring out words of insight that show your maturity. Allah will bring all of that out. And Allah will also bless for you your knowledge. Allah will bless your knowledge for you. And Allah will bless your affairs for you. And the person will be given the ability in goodness in his actions and in his speech because of his etiquettes. So all of this is something that the student is told by his teacher that if you do come with good manners and good etiquettes and you carry yourself in a correct way, Allah will do all of this for you. Now, Teaching students is a communal obligation, but if it so happens that there is only one person capable of shouldering that obligation teaching becomes an individual obligation specific to that one person the author here talks about the ruling of teaching now what is the ruling of teaching the author rahimahullah he says teaching the students of knowledge is fardu kifaya 
it's a communal obligation. Communal here means that if a group of people stand up and do it, the rest they don't have to do it. It just requires a group of people to stand up. One individual is more than enough. One individual is more than enough to stand up and to teach. Some scholars they say, no, it has to be more than one. But the point being, if a group of people stand up and they do it, then the rest are not sinners and they are not, they are not going to be punished. But if the author says, there's no one in that village or in that town or in that country to teach except one person, then it becomes an individual obligation. It becomes an individual obligation on that particular individual. It becomes an obligation on that person to stand up and to teach and educate the people. So he can't use the argument of saying that teaching is a communal ob obligation because there is no one else to teach other than you. So he stands up and he teaches. Now, if, however, there is a group of people who are all eligible to teach, then some of them must take this duty upon themselves. And should they all refuse, they all carry the sin of neglecting to teach. Then the author Allah, says, وَإِنْ هُنَاكَ جَمَعَةٌ If a group of people, they are befitting to teach, and they have the credentials and they have the knowledge to teach, then they have to stand up and teach. Okay? They have to. They have to stand up and they have to teach. If they all stop, hold back from teaching and they all say, no, we're not going to teach. All of them become sinners, he says. Kulluhum, all of them, athimu. Bima'ala, they become sinners. If they will all withhold, they become sinners. And if some of them stand up and say, you know what, we're going to teach. Then, sakat al-haraj al baqin Then, uh, what do you call it? The, uh, the burden will be lifted from the rest. Now. If afterwards some of those qualified to carry out the task of teaching do so, the sin of not teaching will be lifted from those who are eligible to teach in the first place. So when those qualified ones stand up and they teach, then the burden is lifted from the rest. And if one of those eligible to teach refuses to do so, his refusal will likely not be regarded as a sin as long as there are those who teach while being qualified to do so. But it is disliked uh, that he should refuse without an excuse. So here the author speaks about if one of them is requested, that he's specifically being requested for, he's being demanded for, they want the people want him, and he refuses. He says there's already a group of people standing up for it, I will take on that responsibility. The strongest of the two, or the most apparent of the two views, uh, uh, sorry, Nawawi says the two of the, the two opinions, he says that he's not sinning, but it's disliked for him. If he doesn't have excuse. If he doesn't have excuse, then it's disliked for him. Now. It is recommended that the teacher be eager to teach his students and give precedence to this, to this duty over any worldly affairs. The teacher here, he should, now he talks about this chapter, the striving of the teacher in teaching the students. The teacher, he should love the idea of teaching his students. It should be something he loves and he enjoys. He should give that precedence over any worldly gain. Okay? There, but the author says, As long as it's not a necessary worldly gain. What is a necessary worldly gain? If the teacher has to get his children food, and his wife, then he has to go and attain, he has to go and get that. He has to do that. But after that, he should love teaching his students over any other worldly gains. For example, if he's getting a job where he's going to get more than his needs, he shouldn't go for that over teaching his students. He should stay with his students and he should love being with them and educating them. Naam. He should be eager to make them understand and treat each of his students in accordance with their capabilities. He should thus not overburden the student. You jump something. Okay. You jump something. Uh, right. um, be eager to teach your students and give precedence to this duty over any of the affairs, provided such affairs aren't necessary, and to free his heart of any kind of distraction while teaching them. The and teacher, whilst the students are reading on him, that he what? He distances. He gets rid of anything that's going to preoccupy his mind whilst he's listening to his students. While he's teaching them and he's educating them, any gadgets or anything that he's going to use that are going to get in his way 
from teaching these students or even focusing fully on their articulation of letters like the teacher shouldn't be using his phone okay and the students are listening he's listening to his students and he's using his phone or he's talking on his phone or some some places in the world you find that the teachers actually tell you four or five people to read at the same time really are you really able to do that as a teacher tell three people to all read at the same time is that really teaching them how do you know which one's saying what that's not true that's not a reality so the teacher he frees his heart he gets rid of everything that will distract him. So he can fully focus on these students when he's teaching them the Quran. He listens to their pronunciation, their recitation, what they are reading, how they are reading it, what are they saying what is that which is right, what are they saying that which is wrong. He's fully focused on them. And the things that distract are a lot and they're well known. And now, alhamdulillah, the fact that the author didn't mention a particular thing shows what? It shows that the uh, things that are distracting are far greater now than it was at his time. Far greater now. He should be eager to make them understand and treat each of his students in accordance with their capabilities. The so teacher, his efforts should be directed at making the students understand. So it's not just his gay aim, it's not that he throws the knowledge out there. With his students though, he's got something else in mind, which is that he wants them to understand. Did you understand? Are you guys with me? He wants them to understand. And he also observed each person's ability, that if nobody's the same. My mother always used to say that your fingers are not the same. They all come from the same palm and they're not the same. So the humans are not all the same. People are all not the same. Everyone's different. But the teacher observes that. He doesn't treat the one that learns fast the same as the one who doesn't learn fast. He doesn't. He treats them all in accordance to their ability. That's the job of a teacher. Now, He should direct them to revising what they have memorized and praise, them, praise those who do well, provided he doesn't fear that this will lead them to conceit and self-admiration. The author mentions, فَلَا يُكْثِرُوا عَلَى مَنْ لَمْ مَنْ لَا يَحْتَمِلُ الْإِكْثَارَ وَلَا يُقَصِّرَ وَلَا يُقَصِّرُ لِمَا يَحْتَمِلُ الزِّيَادَةَ That the author, Rahimahullah, mentions that the way he observes their ability and their capability is by not increasing too much on the one who can't take too much. He doesn't say to a student who, you learn five pages, and you learn five pages. This one can, but this one can't. So it's not fair that you make them both the same. You see, they say, طُعْمُ الْكِبَارِ سُمُّ الصِّغَارِ The food of the elders is a poison for the youngsters. And here it doesn't necessarily mean only age. It also means, it also means capability. Somebody's capability is big, and another person's capability is like a baby's. So you need to observe those. So it doesn't give the one who can't take more than what he can. And he also doesn't fall short by saying, okay, you, you work five pages, you can't do five pages, how many pages can you do? Two pages, okay, you do two pages. Whereas he, on the other hand, can do more than two pages, but I force him to stay on two pages. He said, also you shouldn't do that. Well, you're weakening him, you're crippling him, you're causing him uh, never to progress and advance. He can, he can take that. So you don't go overboard with the one who can take more. Oh, well, can't take more, sorry. And the one who can take more, you don't reduce it for him. Uh, you shouldn't do that. He also says, One of the things that the teacher does is that he always brings them back to their previous revival. He, revi he always brings them back to the what? He always brings them back to their mahfuzat. Mahfuzat means what? He makes them go over their previous studied work. Have you, re have you re studied just amana? You're, you're just tabarak, right? Go back to just amana. It's no benefit if the teacher just keeps moving forward. The author is saying no. He always brings them back to the previous revised or previous studied works. So that's what happened. I remember when we were, when we were studying in Somalia, we would study two pages. But the way we do that two pages is that if the way we would do it is, for example, you do a page of Surah Al-Furqan. Every single day you're reading the Surah before it. So for example, Surah Al-Furqan, when you read uh, which is, I think, the third page. If we add, if we make the small part of Surah Al Furqan a page. So every single time you start from Surah Al Furqan, every single time, even if you take a new page, you're always going to start from Furqan, every time. 
And now generally what you see is a lot of people, what they do is they memorize the page, you see, and that's it. They keep moving forward. And what's happening is there's like a brush, a broom that's been used, vacuuming everything that was already there. You see, so the person is actually cleaning behind what's, what's been taught. So when he goes back, he's like, whoa, did I even ever study this? Sah? So look what we used to do, we used to do, and then when you finish Surah Al-Furqan, you go over it all, all of it. You start from beginning to end. Because remember, you studied each page diff set in different times, right? Are you with me, brothers? Um, it, for us, it wasn't a page. It was more than a page. Because we used to do it in the morning, we used to do it in the evening, and we used to do it at night time, three times a day. The Quran is three times a day in Somalia. The teachers come in the morning for me, he used to come in after Asr for me, and he used to come in uh, after Salat al-Isha. All of those three times you're reading the Quran. So, the point being though, the point is that going over what you already memorized. You know what's better? That you know what you memorized, then going forward. That's honestly the better, best. What you have is always better than what you don't have, right? Somalis, they have a saying which is, fruits that you have in your palm, or you have in your hand, is better what's on top of a tree. Sah? You don't own what's on the tree. You don't drop what you have in your hand, and you, it's your ownership. You don't drop that for something that's on the top of a tree, right? You don't. What that means is that you don't leave a surah that you've studied and you've memorized for something you've not memorized yet. That's not in your possession yet. So you give more importance to what you've taken on board. So that's what the author is saying. And then the author says, The teacher praises the one who he sees. If he sees any of the students who has najab, and najab means this student is a bit smart, mashallah, Allah, he's got the brain, he's, he's good. The teacher should praise the student, say, mashallah, what I see you is a good future. You seem like a person who knows what he's doing. You're focused, okay. He should praise that student. Okay, the author they says, ما لم يخشى عليه فتنة As long as he doesn't fear for him any form of fitna. If there is a fear that there is a fitna that's going to, that's going to come from it, and the fitna here can be what? بإعجاب أو غيره That he gets full of himself. He start thinking, that, you know, I'm the man. You see, my teacher knows me now. I'm recognized. I'm the man. Yeah? If he starts thinking that he's the man, and you think he's going around to students and saying to them, guess what? Have you ever been praised like this? No. Well, guess what? I have. That's what I'm saying. Nothing more. Hmm? I'm the man. So if he feels like he's going to do that, he's going to go around and bashing all the other students, and he's going to be full of himself. And the next day he won't come to class, and you're like, why didn't you come? I'm the one. Who, I'll memorize it just like that. So, this is ijab. becomes becomes full of himself. You see, and the teacher shouldn't say that to him. Likewise, he should gently reprimand those who underperform, provided that this will not drive them away or cause them to flee. The author says that وَمَنْ قَصَّرَ And anyone who's not sharp, who's not up to standard, who's not up to scratch, عَنَّفَهُ He rebukes him, he scolds him, he reprehends him. But تَعْنِيفَ الْمَطِيفَ مَا لَمْ يَخْشَتْ عَلَى تَنْفِيرُ As long he does it in a manner, a mild manner, that he doesn't... Uh, as long as he doesn't fear that he's going to run away. If he feels that he's going to run away, then he should try to bring him closer then. He shouldn't speak to him like that then. Huh? Our teachers will mash us up. Huh? They will beat us up severely. In this book so far, have you seen anything to do with beating up? No, he doesn't bring any of that up. That's why our teachers, they did study this. They just memorized the Quran. They started teaching it. They just started teaching it. So that's what I'm saying. You guys need to study these books and take it to the Quran. Huh? Mm. A teacher must not be envious of any of his outstanding students and must not feel that Allah has favored them with, with that which uh, they do not deserve. Sometimes a teacher might enter his heart jealousy and he might think to himself, Allahu Akbar, my student is actually passing me. Whoa, what Qur'an did you do? Because the teacher is only on Qur'an Hafs. He's only studied that. He's mastered that Qur'an. Qira'a. And he's always been teaching hafs, right? The student goes out and he starts learning other sciences, and the student goes and he memorizes other qiraat, and the teacher starts getting what starts entering into his heart is hasid. Whoa, what's he doing? It's my own student. 
And subhanAllah, you know, I never thought that that was ever going to be the case until I saw a brother who memorized the Qur'an and he was teaching the Qur'an and I saw his teacher become so jealous of him because he actually had learned more Qur'an than him, more other sciences and qira'at that the teacher always somehow wanted to have the upper hand over his student. Don't teach her anywhere I don't give you permission to. You can only teach what I tell you to teach. Who do, who do you, and he belittles the student. Who do you think you are going out and teaching the Qur'an? It was all based on what? It was all based on hasad because libara'atin tadhharu minhu it became apparent from the student it became apparent from the student that he was sharp and this is something subhanallah you find in sciences as well people who taught you become very jealous very very jealous that they see you now to shout ilayhi bil balan people are pointing at you people are referring back to you people it enters them jealousy and envy hasad and etc The opposite happens. A, t a student that used to be your student, if you, if you stop teaching him because of lack of consistency that you saw in him and you thought that this student is not really serious and you go and you teach another student, you always find that that student has jealousy and envy towards the other student, مثلاً, and that consistently happens. So you see this on the spectrum, on a high level, if you really observe. No. Indeed, even the envy of strangers is a grievous sin. And so the envy of those who are as one's own children should be that much more reprehensible. So hasad towards the general mass is haram and it's severe haram. You can't be jealous of a normal person on the street. What, do, what, do you, what is it going to be if it's a person who memorized the Quran? Why? Why? He's learned the book of Allah. That should make you happy. That should make you really happy. This, should act, this is a person who is at the level of your child. He's like your son now. He shouldn't be upset. He should be very happy. Rather, every good that he's doing comes back to you. Every good that he's doing, it's, a, it's on your scale of the Day of Judgment. You're the one who taught him. You should look at it like that and say, I'm happy. You see? And of course, it brings us back to the statement of Imam Shafi'i. Shafi'i was what? I wish people learned and they took knowledge, but nothing was attributed to me. So whether I teach this other qira'ah or whether I'm taught it, so whether I go and I teach this other qira'ah or whether my student does it, either way it's somebody who's done that job and that's what makes me happy. That it's done. In the hereafter, the teacher will be rewarded greatly for the virtues of the students he has taught and in this life he will be praised for his efforts. Yeah. And Allah is the grantor of success. That's the reality. That this teacher will be praised and he will get immense reward for teaching the student of his. That he educated, that he taught. You see, and the day of and in his dunya, people praise him as well. Even if he's not, even if that's what he's looking for, and he will get that because everybody will be like, "Who's your teacher again?" To the student, and he's always going to mention you. So, in other words, that's where it's going to go back to. But that's not what your concern is. Your concern is the day of judgment. This is a reward that you await from Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. It's something that you can get closer to Him Subhanahu wa Taala. We will take, inshallah, a 15 minutes break and then we'll come back again, inshallah, ta'ala.